time I talk to a patient about it. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly about one more thing, which is cognitive flexibility. And so George Bonanno, who I talked about earlier, has a theory about resilience that it is all about cognitive flexibility. And I think there's some truth to that. I think there's other things associated with resilience, but we know from the work that we do both in the workshops and in the psychotherapy that acceptance, uh, leaning toward accepting situations beyond your immediate control, reappraising situations using our good CBT skills, learning from failures and seeing failure is not as a never event, but as something that we pick ourselves up from, uh, relying on humor, which healthcare workers are very good at, and finding people and places with whom you can share your emotions. It's not just about bottling stuff up and, and suppressing it. It's about finding an appropriate forum for those emotions to be validated. And what we know, and I, I sort of love this study. Um, this is a study done two years ago, uh, in part by Daniela Schiller, who's at Sinai. Uh, and this research group had folks come in to the lab, talk about upsetting memories. They had to identify a personal trauma and they were split up into four groups. I'm going to talk about just one or two of these groups, but the important one is the positive group. The positive group was asked to focus on positive aspects of the event. What was learned about yourself? What were the kind of post-traumatic growth things that you learned as a result of this event? The negative group focused on the negative aspects, like how it affected them emotionally adversely. Um, and then their neutral group were just describing the facts of the event and not really focusing on the emotional aspects. What they found are those folks who were asked to focus on the positives felt better after recall, felt better immediately and felt better weeks later. And in follow-up studies of brain imaging, the neural representation of the memory changed. The memory gets brought up. And we do this in psychotherapy all the time. A patient brings up a memory and they actually then through working through it, processing the impact of the event on themselves, reframing it, they put the memory back in their brains differently. So the next time they recall it, it might be less distressing. It might come with less guilt or shame or anxiety. Memories are very malleable. And this research is an example of that. And we definitely make use of that um, known fact all the time in the work that we do psychotherapeutically. Um, I'm gonna talk very briefly about self-care. When I talk about self-care, I essentially mean doing what you need at the time doing what works for you. One of the models that we put forward is a model developed by the armed forces called the stress continuum model. And it breaks down stress responses into four buckets and uh, ranging from ready, doing your best, being in a flow state as, as a, uh, one positive psychology researcher would call it, uh, to being injured or critical, having psychiatric symptoms. And what we teach folks on units, what we teach leaders is that they need strategies. They need to know the signs that they're in each of these different zones, and they need personalized strategies that work for them, not for anybody else, for addressing uh, when they feel uh, it, when they feel to be in one of these zones. So self care isn't just about doing meditation and exercise and eating right. Those are fine, but it's about developing a personalized toolbox that works for you based on the level of stress that you're feeling. And for healthcare workers who are used to triaging patients, this is a helpful framework because it's essentially triaging themselves and making an appropriate treatment plan for themselves based on the severity that they're observing. So in conclusion, I wanna say a few things and then open it up for questions. So our center, um, we're really lucky. I think we're one of the more comprehensive centers to focus on healthcare worker wellbeing. Um, offers a range of offerings that translate the basic and clinical science um, from Mount Sinai and from elsewhere to facilitate resilience in the folks that, that do the hard work every day. Um, and we, I should say, um, we're for everybody. So um, one of the groups that we found to be most affected in the, the paper we just published on symptoms was admin staff. So front desk staff, um, who are not talked about in research and may not be the focus of other interventions, but where we take it, take this research and translate it and make it available to everyone. Um, we are doing ongoing research, as you saw of some of the papers. We are developing our app further. Um, and 
Uh, we also began to develop some novel tools that might be helpful in evaluating the impact of our services, but also the impact of interventions offered elsewhere. Um, and also to characterize the many different facets of resilience, potentially better than existing uh, psychological scales. So I'm gonna end there and leave ample time for questions if there are some. So we can start with the q and A. I will read them. Dr. DiPiero will answer them. And the first one is from Paul Molia. Mm -hmm. A great presentation. Your scholarship here is both timely and impressive. One, you mentioned interest as the most robust variable toward the start of your talk. Can you explain that further? Yeah, feeling engaged and connected to your daily work. Feeling like what you did, what you were doing had a purpose. Um, so it's related to purpose in life, but specifically related to uh, the work they were doing at the moment, uh, finding meaning in that. So any other questions, please enter them into the, the chat. Um, I have a question. Um, I'm noticing in my own practice that I'm suddenly getting a bunch of referrals from people who I don't think were that distressed during the pandemic, but seem to be having a cumulative effect of it. Um, in family members, they, a whole bunch of people lost a family member, a number of other family members having significant mental health concerns and, and physical concerns. Are you seeing that? Or, uh, do you know of research of that, that you might actually see the emotional distress a few years after the worst of the event? Yeah, one of the things that I, um, a slide that I sometimes show is what's called the psychological stages of disaster. Um, and it's a, a graph by SAMHSA that shows emotional responses. And really at the height of an event, as it's acutely happening, there's often a community cohesion and people coming together. So think about the clapping for healthcare workers, the free food, the inrush of supplies and support, the concerts. And then the pandemic continued and all that support went away. So we get enter into year two, year three, uh, and then there are additional stressors that people face. So they might've... Uh, been um, delaying healthcare. There has been an increase in workplace violence that's been very concerning within the healthcare setting. Uh, there have been a lot of there's been a lot of turnover and people choosing different career paths. That's been putting pressure on folks that still work here um, because they might have to do more temporarily. So there are, I think, del delayed indirect effects of the pandemic that we're observing. And I also think that it might have motivated people to seek treatment who might not otherwise have sought treatment before. It gave them a sort of excuse. Thank you. And we have another question from Gregory Henriksen. Can you recommend a good overview article and or book on resilience? Yes, so I would recommend the 2013 article in American um, European Journal of Psychotraumatology by Southwick and Yehuda uh, and, and, and Mastin and others. Um, the article from 2020, 2020 uh, to Bibnia, uh, single author of that paper on the neuroscience of resilience. Uh, and there are a number of articles written by uh, Dean Charney and Steve Southwick in 2020 and 2021 uh, that were provided an overview of the different resilience factors and the research uh, related to them. And then the next uh, question is from Joanna Festa. Joanne Festa, thank you for this informative talk. Are you engaging with Mount Sinai staff across other departments beyond ICU staff? I agree that administrative staff are often the brunt of stressful interactions with patients who tend to direct their frustration at them. How can we help them? Yeah, so the federal grant um, has us addressing, to start off with, ICUs, emergency departments, and med surge floors, which is quite a lot of the hospital system, uh, and it is a system-wide endeavor. Um, our broader center efforts uh, do connect us with lots of different departments, and we really uh, love going to meet people and talking to people about the services that are available and finding um, tailored ways to um, provide some of this intervention to folks that might not otherwise receive it so readily. Uh, so for example, we recently did some work with security officers at Mount Sinai Hospital, and once a week for six weeks, we met in the hospital chapel and talked about 
uh, some of these resilience factors and also to provide a training to the managers in security around psychological safety and trauma-informed care such that, you know, after adverse events that security officers respond to, the managers might be better equipped to respond to the immediate needs. Okay, um, so the next question is Paul, from Paul Molia. Uh, this was question two. You had PHQ, PHQ2. Was that a typo? Is there a PHQ8? Three, your office offers both the 13 huddle type five to 10 minute presentations and the series of workshops. Could you review this for us again? Yeah, so compound question. Um, there were, I think that slide that I referred to, uh, there are lots of different measures of depression, screening measures of depression. Uh, you're probably all familiar with PHQ-2, which is the first two items addressing anhedonia and depressed mood, the PHQ-8, which is everything except the thoughts of self-harm, and the PHQ-9. Um, in all but, uh, so just to go through the, some of the waves of the survey, in the first wave survey in April 2020 and the December 2020 staff survey both used the PHQ-8. Um, the um, survey last summer, because we asked a whole bunch of other questions, um, we asked the PHQ-2 and the um, question number nine about thoughts of self-harm uh, and thoughts of being better off dead. Uh, and in our treatment service, we give the full PHQ-9. Uh, so we're capturing depressive symptoms from the population with PHQ-2 or the PHQ-8, uh, and more recently adding this, the question about self-harm. And in our treatment service, we regularly give the entire PHQ-9. Um, and uh, I should say about the resilience workshops, um, we offer these five huddle topics. We actually had a curriculum of 11 meetings at the very, uh, we were very ambitious at the very start of our center uh, in 2020, uh, each chapter of the resilience text had its own meeting plus an introductory meeting. And we realized people don't have time for that. So we needed to be thoughtful about how to condense the material, how to combine the factors. Uh, and we really try to hit the highlights. Um, and we um, have really carried over those topics into the huddles and have added conversations in the huddles on units about mental health symptoms as well. Uh, so, for example, how do you recognize, like, what are the signs of depression, what are the treatments that are available, what are the signs of PTSD, what are the treatments that are available? Um, so we really try to be flexible, but also evidence-based in the way we're, we're uh, condensing things. And we really tr also try to me carefully measure the impact and the, um, how people like it. Have another comment from an anonymous attendee. Can you say more about patient responses to working on personal resiliency in context of structural issues, especially for trainees or those with less power to implement change? Yeah, so uh, we've, I think that's partly why we've pivoted some of the content to more structural issues because we don't want it, we don't want the message to be, hey, you're a trainee, you've got lots of stress, uh, handle it yourself and here's how you can handle it. We want people to know that, hey, like some of this distress is, makes sense given the situations that you're being placed in with patients or maybe leaders that are more or less communicative. Um, and um, as part of the interventions that we do, we have been increasingly training the leadership of those services in some of the interventions uh, in some of the topics as well. Uh, but we are uh, really mindful that we don't want our understanding of resilience to be, you got to pick yourself up out by your own bootstraps. We need to acknowledge and address the structural barriers and limitations, advocate for change where we can uh, in collaboration with our, our partners in OWBR and the Office of Faculty Development. So our next comment and question is from Jason Stahl. Hi, Jason. What I found very helpful is how you are flexible in the notions of system of service delivery and are bringing treatment to the people where they are versus having them come to the office exclusively. Did you run into any barriers to entry in these systems? No, not really. Uh, there are, um, there's always gonna be some healthcare workers, especially here at Sinai, which is such a big system that would rather not get care provided by their own uh, health system. They'd rather not their care be documented in Epic, uh, they have privacy concerns, um, even though there are many, many privacy protections that we put in place. Uh, and we have to, I think, acknowledge that and help those folks get care outside. Uh, the majority of folks that we've encountered, maybe because they've 
called us don't express that concern and um, in fact get care very quickly. It's a very low cost to them. Um, the limitation that we've encountered is the limitation that you've all encountered being we are only allowed to practice in states in, in, when our patient is in a state where we are licensed. So if I'm not licensed in New Jersey or Connecticut, uh, if a patient is in New lives in New Jersey or Connecticut and is calling in from home, I can't see them. Uh, and I think that's that's more of like a federal advocacy thing than an individual issue that we have, but something that we've encountered as well. Um, but really, I think telehealth has really lowered the access barriers quite a bit. Uh, there are patients, um, for, for example, some nurses or technicians who don't have privacy at work to do a telehealth visit during their lunch break. And we have a couple of spaces uh, on MSH campus um, and also at BI where folks can come to have a telehealth visit like with an HD camera um, and a big screen uh, if they don't have privacy at their place of work. And then the next question is, is the Mount Sinai rating scale available? It is. Uh, so even email me, um, it is currently under review. Uh, at a journal, uh, the initial validation study, but I'm happy to share it with you if you email me. Then we have a chat, um, one from Mary Minges. Minges, wonderful presentation, great and meaningful work. Thanks, Jonathan. And thanks, Lisa, good to see you. Hi, Mary. So <laughs> we are all in the same system. Um, and then uh, another chat is wonderful presentation, John, this is from Paul Molia, inspiring and hopeful and hope generating. So that is Thank lovely. You, You're a very good advocate for our services, Paul, especially at South Nassau. Um, anything else? Any other questions or comments before I disconnect? Yeah, we have a couple minutes. One more. Let's see what we got. Wonderful work from Sandra Lowe. Thank you. Um, okay, from Marina Mazur, great presentation, thank you. So I think, let's, oh, am I missing a couple of, um, and then can you please give your email? This is from Adele Zinberg. Yes, I'm sending it right now in the chat to everyone, um, everyone. And there's a question from an anonymous attendee. Um, are you hiring? Okay. Um, we actually don't have any active postings right now. Um, we just had a posting uh, a couple of months ago. Um, and it, it, I think we just need to be mindful of being able to support ourselves. Uh, we do get revenue from billing, uh, but we need to be mindful of productivity and being able to keep this going. Uh, so we have to really look at when we need to hire and when we have the funds to hire uh, pretty closely, just like all the other services, I'm sure. There's also a question about CEUs for social workers. Um, this grant rounds provide CE, uh, CE credit for psychologists. Um, we have been in conversation with the social work department, but I'm not aware of they're providing their own uh, CEUs. So you might try and click on the psychologist link that's in the chat and see if that translates. But other than that, I, I'm not aware of uh, specific uh, credit for social workers. Okay, so I think at this, we should probably uh, finish up. And thank you everybody for your attendance and participation. And absolutely thank you, Dr. DiPiera for a wonderful talk um, and for all the great work that you're doing for our system and for everyone in it. Thank you for the invitation, take care.